is what it's about it to. Um, creating the best in class workplace experience based on technology and service. Next slide. And Peter, you might have to, yeah, you might have to click an engagement there. There you go, good. Uh, we won't have uh, polls administered this morning. Um, we will have Q&A at the end of the session. There'll be a little written question box down in the lower right of your, uh, on your, excuse me, the lower part of your control panel. Um, a survey may pop up after you close the webinar, so be alert for that if you if you get a chance. And uh, both the um, the PowerPoint, uh, actually, there's a PDF, and the recorded webinar will be available on FMCC, uh, FMC, F, my FMCC Workplace in the next few days. So thank you very much for being here. Next slide. Uh, FMCC, the Facility Management Consultants Council, uh, here in IFMA, to, to serve facility management and consultants as best we can, and the profession in general um, as a global provider. Uh, go ahead, Peter. Next slide. Are the services we provide, the central themes of them anyway, Ask the Expert, uh, online educational resources. We, we team with IFMA in, in all of this, of course. Uh, finding a consultant, uh, locating a speaker. Next slide. Our sponsors of uh, ISS, Greg Moore Group, Daikin, GFMA, ESAR One, uh, thank you very much for your support. They've been with us year after year. Uh, next slide. So here we are, World FM Week. And uh, next slide, Peter. Uh, the core team, uh, I mean, to uh, put on a shirt and tie. Uh, and more august looking personalities or august personalities left and right. Uh, next slide. And the whole of uh, an impressive lot. Uh, next slide. This morning, um, ISS uh, with us um, and we'll hand the control over to them momentarily. Let me have the next slide and we'll take a look at the objectives. Learning objectives. Well, understand and navigate the trends that will affect the future of work. Want to develop robust and resilient workplace strategies that are geared toward an increasingly complex business environment. Well, we know. Uh, third, use service design and management to deliver experiences at the most value-generating moments. And four, insights on how to balance focus on end-user experiences and support organization strategy. Next slide, and over to you, Peter. All right. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, my name is Peter Angestian uh, from ISS, uh, and I will be one of the presenters at, at this um, uh, at, during this presentation. Uh, I just want to congratulate everybody and, and wish everybody a happy uh, World FM Day. It's a, it's a big day where we are celebrating uh, facility management uh, and facility managers around the world, uh, and I also want to congratulate the FMCC on, on taking on this uh, role and hosting uh, a line of events uh, during uh, FM Week. Uh, I think it's really valuable, and I think it's a, it's a group of people that uh, we, we are happy to celebrate. Uh, they're doing great work out there. So uh, let's just uh, focus on uh, the presentation here. Um, today's presentation will cover uh, how we navigate the trends that we believe will affect the future of work. Uh, we also want to touch upon the major drivers of change uh, affecting the workplace that we work at and, and services uh, that are supporting the workplace. And finally, uh, how we can design a service delivery system that creates value for the organization uh, and all its stakeholders, uh, including uh, guests visiting, of course, the employees uh, uh, working at the facility on a day-to-day -day level, but also uh, I think the the things that we're presenting and discussing here are relevant also if it's a hospital and we're talking about patients or if it's a if it's a school or university and we're talking about students uh, I think these are a, a general sort of themes that are applicable uh, throughout the um, um, sort of the build environment um, when we're talking about creating best-of-class uh, workplaces it really requires going beyond solely looking at workplace efficiency um, there's still efficiency gains to be had out there, no doubt about it, uh, but I think uh, the focus on, on driving uh, the lowest 
sort of minimum cost points uh, which we were at during the financial crisis. I think we've sort of gone beyond that uh, and there's a, a strong sort of tendency to get a more balanced focus on end user experience, strategy and especially culture and then using a service design of course supported by data to deliver great work, workplace experiences. And, and what we can see from our research is that, that, that it's really about creating workplace experiences. It's about creating workplaces that are attractive uh, in order to uh, retain and attract uh, new talent and also uh, showcase uh, the brand uh, that you're servicing. Uh, we are servicing as facility managers uh, and, and how to get sort of lift the brand on a day-to-day -day basis, both in terms of employee engagement, but of course also in terms of uh, the guests visiting and being exposed to this brand. Our research in, in this presentation is based on a, on a long-standing relationship with the, the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies uh, and especially using uh, their uh, capability of, of looking into the crystal ball uh, and, and the, all their future work, especially on megatrends and uh, on industry research, especially related to the corporate real estate environment and facilities management. But in addition to this, uh, uh, for this particular um, research project, we surveyed uh, around 1,500 uh, facility management corporate real estate uh, professionals uh, together with Corner Global uh, and uh, IFMA in order to sort of get a real sort of empirical uh, input in terms of uh, what, what we were servicing, uh, surveying uh, in terms of the future of service and how it affects facilities management. So I think it's, it's fair to say that it's really a strong uh, empirical base that we are uh, building some of the conclusions on. And on top of that, we then conducted uh, 12 uh, deep dive interviews with uh, subject matter experts uh, that are all uh, in the area of facility management, service management, or IT uh, and IT development, uh, as these were the most sort of profound uh, areas that we were covering. Uh, our research series is called the ISS 2020 Vision White Books. Uh, we have uh, five of them now. We just launched the fifth one last year and we are working on the sixth and final, what we call capstone uh, a report, uh, which is basically uh, base, basing uh, its finding on the conclusions of the previous uh, five white books. Uh, the white books are all free of download. You can download them on, on our website. Uh, you can either go on servicefutures.com or Better Workplaces or you can go on the issworld.com website and download uh, this material. Uh, there's no attachments, it's, it's free downloads. Uh, they are typically about uh, between 100 and 140 pages research and we also attach, of course, all the empirical studies uh, and um, uh, surveys that we have done together with Cornet Global, IFMA or IAOP in these uh, particular uh, surveys that we're doing. And then I just uh, want to sort of uh, close my introduction by a, by a quote by, by Bill Gates, which I really like. Um, and, and Bill Gates is saying that we have a tendency to overestimate the change that will occur in the short term and then underestimate the change that will occur in the more long-term perspective. Don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. Uh, and, and that little last sentence is actually quite important because I think there has been a tendency that in the corporate real estate and facility management environment um, that we have sort of been late bloomers in terms of um, developing and adapting uh, new technologies into the workplace. Uh, I think it's coming now. There's a tsunami of technology that is rolling over us and I think all um, major corporations within the FM uh, environment are working with uh, smart buildings, cognitive building, intelligent services, and all these things uh, that we are looking into at the moment. And, and we will, of course, touch upon them uh, as we go along. But, but, uh, but I think it is important to say that some, when we're looking into a crystal ball, uh, some of the changes that we see coming uh, just around the corner may not actually be around the corner. Uh, they may be a little more long-term perspective before we see the real change. Uh, but there is a lot of change happening at the moment in the industry. And there's no doubt that we'll be hit by this change um, probably uh, rate later rather than sooner, but, but nevertheless, it, 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 uh, we are absolutely convinced that, uh, that it will actually happen. So yeah. over to you, Jeff. And uh, yeah, hi, this is Jeff Saunders from the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, and thank you, Peter, for the introduction. And now we're going to be talking about how we navigate the trends that will affect the future of work. And when we talk about this, uh, 
aspect of trends, we're not only talking about what are the trends affecting the workplace, but what are the, the trends affecting the nature of work and uh, the stakeholders who are going to be making use of the, the different facilities and technologies in the workplace um, in the future towards 2020 and beyond. Now, when we start talking about the future of the workplace and creating best-in-class workplaces, we have to understand a bit of the, the journey that, that the workplace has been on over the last uh, century. Um, and we've gone from a, a focus which is highly um, targeted towards um, driving efficiency, specialization, and productivity in workers. And then uh, starting in the 1960s in Germany, you started getting a little shift saying that this very corporatist and very tailored approach to management of the workplace wasn't driving um, actual productivity to the degree that people thought among workers. And so you started a movement being launched around creating more um, people-centric, more um, team building in, in organizations and creating common identities and the like. And that really started to roll out in the 1990s where we started seeing activity-based workplaces and that's where you see a lot of the discussion um, focused upon the last um, decade or so and continuing to be really hot right now. But we're seeing a transition driven by technology, driven by the opportunities that people could work now from anywhere where it's changing the nature of the discussion around the workplace, not only as a place that drives efficiency and productivity and better teamwork and collaboration, but it's a place where you actually have to be attractive and you have to start dealing with experiences, bringing user centricity and bringing notions of well-being into the workplace and actually talking about what is the user experience in the workplace to make it attractive it's a place for people to not only um, want to work there but want to keep coming back as a place where they could actually develop great ideas um, and actually develop innovative approaches. So what we're seeing now driven by technology, 4G, the emergence of 5G and all the devices that people have on hands from smartphones, tablets, laptops, um, glasses, augmented reality devices and the like is that people can truly work from anywhere um, they would like. So the workplace is transitioning from a place to an activity that you could do in the here and now. So the workplace emerges into the work now and it covers a range of settings a, a worker could choose to work from the office, from a co-working hub, a public place, working from home and the workplace and the need to be supported covers this range of settings and organizations are being challenged not only to develop a facility solution, but a technology solution that works seamlessly across these environments so that their employees can actually be productive and deliver value um, to the organization as time goes on. So this requires bringing different pieces together to drive um, employee engagement and to drive uh, more productive workplaces. So when we talk about the future of work and we talk it in a general um, setting, an explorative setting where we say this is how work is developing. We talk about what is the nature of work, how is the workforce going to be developed, what is the workplace, and how it is emerged. And what organizations and facility managers and corporate real estate practitioners need to do is to translate this into understanding what is the strategy that the organization has and what is the strategy that they would like to drive for the company, what is the culture of the organization that is needed to do that, and where is it now, and where would you like to have it in the future, what are the people that you need to attract um, and retain, but not only attract and retain, but how can you get them to integrate, to work um, together and collaborate faster um, and more efficiently and more productively and creatively than before, and then ask themselves, what are the facilities, the technologies, and the services that can enable um, this organization and organism to deliver effectively. And that's that key responsibility as a facilitator that the facility management managers and corporate real estate professionals are going to be having to do across a more complex range of providers um, in the future. 
when we bring this together, when we start looking at work, workplace, and the workforce, we see a number of trends and challenges for the future. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into all of these in detail. We'll be touching upon them briefly as we go along. Um, but organizations uh, now and towards 2020, due to automation, the emergence of artificial intelligence, globalization, increasing competition, and the like, that they're being faced with um, an accelerating pace of change and more disruptive forces. So they need to be able to adapt and adjust their strategies, their ways of working, and the talents that they have on hand um, in a much more uh, resilient fashion. So they need to be proactive and adaptive toward change. And this is because technology is breaking down internal and external barriers and enabling us to work in entirely new and different ways. And it enables organizations to leverage communities in the city environment. So we could talk in urban contexts of the office environment being the city and how can you leverage the urban areas to deliver the facilities that you once had on site. But at the same time, automation leads to polarization of the workforce and workplace amenities, driving increasingly individualistic uh, requirements and greater diversity of a more global workforce. And because there's this great deal of change and talk of change and different types of being able to work nonstop from anywhere all the time, there's putting placed greater pressures on workers and managers around the world. So there's a greater focus on health and well-being and the costs to, to companies and to individuals around the world and how can we as facility managers and corporate real estate professionals deliver on that. And of course, um, with the greater use of technology and the more um, targeted granular information we get about people, we're able to offer services and requirements that are much more targeted towards the user's preferences and choices with a greater deal of personalization. So this idea of a one-size-fits-all solution no longer works. It's tailor-made to the organization and to the individual at hand. And bringing these together when you talk about it in your um, strategic approach is to understand what do organizations need, um, how are they reworking their business models, practices, um, employment practices and need for fin facility um, and physical space, and what are the end users? How are they looking at um, what role does work play in their life? How do they want to work? Where do they want to work? Um, how much do they want to work? And in these two competing agendas, the facility manager and the corporate real estate professional has to identify what's the right service offering for that. And so what we're seeing um, as we go towards 2020 is the emergence of a number of new uh, organizational um, types. So we've had the traditional um, bureaucracies, change of commands, and hierarchies that we've seen for the last 100 years in the tailors and corporatist office environments towards a new um, emerging type of organization that's much more dynamic, much more agile, much more flexible, and has uh, varying demands on the need for space and the need for services. So these are much more project-oriented work environments, and some of them go over to the complete hierarchy side of the, uh, of the spectrum, where you have very small organizations that deliver a great deal of value to a global audience, and where the people who are actually uh, contributing to the organization actually work in very diverse, um, globalized networks. And the question is, how do you leverage the power of community in that regard? So as we move towards this dynamic uh, way of working with much more individualized services, much more, um, much greater proliferation in organizational types, the services that facility managers will need to offer will be much more tailored and targeted towards um, the, uh, the services that people require in the workplace. And it will be dealing and being leveraged by and delivered through mobile services, greater use of the Internet of Things, big data, and the like. So <clears throat> the major drivers of change that we believe and, and what we have found in our research is affecting the workplace uh, services of the future is basically built up on the sort of three headlines. Uh, one, of course, is technology. 
Uh, the other one is the, uh, as, as Jeff has already touched upon, the workplace and how that is changing in order to support how the organizational structures uh, are changing. And then, of course, finally, the service experience, um, how people are working with services and how the service uh, sort of change uh, as, as the workplace and the technology enables uh, that change. Uh, one of the things that we have, uh, one of the questions that we have been asked a lot is uh, when is the robots taking over and, and when can we have a little pepper robot coming around and serving me coffee and helping me to my meeting room and helping me to, to greet my guests in the reception area. Uh, and uh, I think, again, uh, not to over quote Bill Gates, but, but I think that it's not going to happen soon, uh, what we are seeing. Um, there are service robots uh, there, uh, and, and we're already using some of them, uh, especially in the cleaning environment. Um, but, but I mean, they're big. Uh, they require a lot of floor space, a lot of uh, square meters or square feet uh, to move around. Um, so, uh, and that is developing. It's not developing rapidly, but it is, it is of course, developing, and they're becoming better and better. But on the contrary, there is a lot of um, RPA, uh, robotics process automation or software, uh, or what we call assisted RPA, because uh, we're still in that stage where there's a human interface somewhere in, in the, the process. It's not only machine talking to machine yet, um, but it, uh, we believe there's a, the, the human being still. So, um, so uh, the replacement of robots will undoubtedly happen, uh, but, but it's not going to happen as, as soon as, as some would think, at, at least not according to uh, our research. But what is happening is that the uh, workplace is becoming intelligent. Um, the, the, the buildings are talking to us, and we can now finally hear what they're saying. Uh, we are beginning to connect people uh, with buildings, uh, and technology is uh, enabling that. And we, are, we can use all the data that we are uh, collecting uh, to optimize the, um, the workplace solutions, both in terms of workplace design but, and also in terms of the services that are happening uh, on the sites. Uh, and, and making these two things work together is really the key here. So data connectivity help us to get real-time and historical data and get it on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour, almost minute-by-minute -minute, uh, setup so we can actually use that uh, real-time uh, for insights uh, for analysis and for work order triggers so that it doesn't have to be somebody complaining um, before we can send somebody out to fix a, fix a coffee machine or, or clean the toilet or unclog uh, the, uh, um, the, the drainage or whatever it is uh, that needs to be done. Uh, it can be done uh, by surveying, using sensors uh, and creating work orders uh, automatically uh, to the people that are uh, capable of, of solving the, the problem. And then also using that cognitive, so instead of uh, we actually witness a problem, that we actually get people out before the, the problem really happens and using uh, IoT and especially uh, cognitive um, uh, for, for those kind of sort of predictive uh, usage of the building. So what this means is that, that we, of course, are still using big data uh, and, and technology and intelligence to drive down the asset cost, reduce uh, the total cost of ownership, reduce energy usage per building, and optimize the square meters per employees. Um, but then using some of these savings and some of these efficiencies to actually increase the level of experience, to use the workplace for easier collaboration, for higher employee productivity, to create better learning environments and social environments where people can connect and, and create a more efficient workplace uh, as we move forward. We uh, also asked or posed a few questions about this when we asked the uh, uh, Cornet uh, Global and the IFMA community about these things. And, and what we can see is that uh, some of the developments that will have biggest impact on, on how we service organizations uh, and, and how we service the workplace in the future is uh, the fact that we now got four uh, generations at work at the same time, that there are shift in organizational values that are driving the workplace at the moment, but also the need for individualization and customization that are especially common with the new millennial uh, uh, workforce that are coming into the place. But, but I think it's not particularly uh, uh, critical only for the millennials. It also happens for uh, the baby boomers or, or the 
sort of generations that are in between. So, uh, so these are definitely some of the findings that we are seeing. And when we asked about what will have the biggest impact for potential improvement, uh, it is uh, probably not surprisingly that it's uh, working with uh, customer experience, service quality, and service culture as, as some of the uh, most uh, um, sort of uh, key factors that we're looking for here, although these are more equal uh, in terms of the feedback. So, so the big changes we're seeing is that we are going in a workplace and in a, in a setting and in a collaborational uh, sort of mode uh, that was historically predominantly focused on cost, cost optimization. And we are shifting that in terms of workplace experience. That organization seems to understand the need for having attractive um, workplace, workplaces uh, that will attract uh, several uh, or different generations of workers and will accommodate different generations uh, of, 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 of employees uh, but also that that actually um, it, it's more about the value that you create in the workplace rather than sort driving through the lowest cost point uh, possible and that value comes in, in in creating a better workplace experience because I mean as, as Jeff also said uh, before we don't need to go to the workplace in order to work now. Work is what you do, it's not where you go. We can work from anywhere, um, but organizations have a need to attract people into the workplace, maybe not on a day-to-day -day level, but maybe once a week or once every two weeks or a couple of times a month uh, uh, in order to get people sort of infused, let them socialize, let them network, let them create a community around the workplace be part of that culture that we want to establish as an organization. And that is actually much more valuable and it drives more value to the organization than solely optimizing on the cost. The cost optimization issue will not go away and it shouldn't go away. We should also be lean and, and strong in terms of driving down cost. Uh, but I think focus uh, will change over time towards more workplace experiences. And, and the building usage uh, and the way we're working with space optimization, occupancy rates, uh, benchmarking, understanding what, what are the cost components that we're working with at the moment, how we can optimize this, and also in terms of sustainability around energy usage uh, is, is absolutely key uh, in that cost element. Driving more towards the experience side is the service delivery, how we can work with um, the number of visitors uh, in the building, uh, optimizing uh, the building, the number of people in the uh, in the in the workplace, and also how we can uh, sort of uh, digitalize um, uh, the services in, er in order to uh, create these work order triggers uh, that we I talked about before, and 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 going into predictive maintenance, so we don't have to experience problems before we react, but we can do that. Uh, on a continuous basis before problems occur. And then, of course, finally, uh, towards user engagement, uh, touch point optimizing the touch point, working with service design and service experience, uh, describing what kind of experience do you want to get out of a certain touch point, and then work back for, backwards from there in order to optimize the service level uh, that we are providing. Uh, for example, um, uh, if, if we have certain uh, rush hours in the reception area, uh, we, we need to um, upscale the reception and we need to man it accordingly to where the peak periods are. And then we don't need three or four people in the reception, you know, maybe around 11 o'clock or around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Then these people can do other things around the, the premises and around the organization that will create more value. So we have that flexibility and, and uh, adjustability in terms of our services on a real time. Uh, hour by hour uh, basis and and that we use the workplace analysis that we can do again real time to map and analyze the experience and the efficiency that is creating in order to optimize this on the go uh, that is the the key for this going forward so we are using uh, cognitive buildings to improve the service experience by predicting uh, capacity needs on an ongoing basis finding all the challenges where are people queuing up where are the dissatisfactions in terms of the service levels where can we improve that how can we use the predictive resourcing we, to uh, assign the right people with the right capabilities to the right place at the right time uh, in order to create the best service experience possible? And how can we actually use music, user communication and nudging in terms of, of getting people to use the facilities in the most optimal way? It may not make sense to go to lunch at 1 o'clock 
every day if that's where everybody if that's where the bottleneck is maybe we can intensivize people to go at 12.30 or 1.30 in order to even out the, uh, uh, the demand uh, during, uh, during a workday. Uh, so everybody gets a good experience, uh, for example, of going to the, uh, to the canteen to get lunch or whatever it is. So the experience-based work uh, and designing a service delivery system, Jeff, I know you have some thoughts about that. Yeah, and thank you. This is one of the things that we're seeing. So when you go with the best in class, it's about transitioning this focus, as Peter is saying, from you know, a focus on cost towards a focus on experiences. And that changes the, the focus away from measuring inputs and outputs um, towards a focus on outcomes. How is it that the user is experiencing the environment? And this has a, a, an effect on changing the dynamics about how it is that a facility manager or corporate real estate um, professionals being measured on the service they're providing to the organization because no longer you just you just can't measure how much of X is going in and then a certain element of Y is coming out and you have X an output that's going to be part of it but that's a very transactional relationship and it's one where you're going to have a, a strong focus on commoditization and the like but if you're about if you're about helping organizations deliver on their outcomes that they're trying to achieve and on what the end users are experiencing and you're creating value you're transitioning into a different type of relationship for your um, providers for your end users and the like and so to do this it's around creating a service delivery system that changes the focus of the relationship about putting the end user in focus rather than um, the organizations and the like, and building from that um, a whole service delivery mechanism where you look at what is it that the end user needs to have done to achieve their activities in the workspace? How is it that they would like to receive this service that's being offered? Is it automatic um, via push messages, via a smartphone, or is it via uh, a person interacting at the right touch point and delivering the service at that moment. And then from that, designing what is the profile or the system that needs to be done. What is the service culture in the uh, service organization that could provide this? What degree of employee engagement and service quality needs to be the focus, the customer experience around that, and creating a management system that builds and supports this ecosystem focused on what the end user um, needs to have the most optimal outcome. And many of these uh, findings were, again, coming from our interviews and our surveys with, um, with corporate real estate professionals, FM experts, where they see in their organizations that providing experiences, particularly during service interactions, is becoming more and more important. So in this world where we're having um, and what we're witnessing, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this as well, is that everything is becoming a service. And that is driving end user expectations about what types of services they can expect in a uh, organization. So for example, we have greater expectations for the services that we get at coffee shops. We have greater uh, service expectations that we get from Uber and the like. And so people start asking those questions, why can I get it at work as well? And so this becomes a focus on how do you get better real-time or near real-time responsiveness? How can you go towards driving and anticipating changing requirements and being at the forefront of that and being enable, enabling systems to be there to deliver 24-7 when and where we need it? And for this development system to occur and to be aligned. You need to have it a course to deliver, as we talked about, into the strategy and the organizational values um, that the company is trying to deliver upon. But it also requires trust. So when we start talking about the Internet of Things and my user-centric data, how am I moving through the building? Where am I using certain devices? How am I using certain devices? And we see this next generation of monitoring where we start talking about health and well-being in the workplace. Many of the times it's now being driven towards 
um, stress and biometric data about my experiences in the workplace. And to have that, you need to have trust and transparency related around what is the information that's being collected, how is it being used, and what is it um, that you could have to drive that relationship. And so this together is enabling a new way of working because there's some fundamental challenges that we still haven't cracked the code for. So on one aspect, we have a recognition that there is a need to focus on cost because people aren't coming to the workplaces to work. They're working elsewhere. They're on the go in the office environment. They're out meeting clients. They're traveling the world. So we have um, a recognition that in any given day, 30 to 50 percent of the desks and offices are unoccupied. Um, so we have a lot of activities that we can do during that, uh, during different time frames to improve the utilization of the workplace. But we also noticed that very few workers around the world are actually engaged at the workplace. So if we could do different uh, actions and activities and create different services and experiences that engage people more, then we could actually drive a great deal of value for the organization by creating experiences that actually make people want to come to work and actually integrate and deliver on uh, projects more collaboratively. And due to technology and to the emergence of the freelance and gig economy, we have a huge number of the workforce that are already mobile and many of them actually don't have a regular association to a workplace and many don't want to have a regular association to a workplace. So how do you attract these talents, integrate them into your teams and get them to perform on an ongoing basis? So what corporations and organizations need alternative workplaces that not only promote their corporate culture, not only foster collaboration and knowledge sharing, um, they need to do this with greater speed and flexibility driving innovation and productivity. So this means that the way we work and the workplace um, will be radically different in the future. And what we see is you know, a key challenge, and we touched upon this briefly before, was that you have this huge aspect of co-working and one of the most innovative and disruptive and what everybody has been talking about the last two to three years at all the facility management uh, events is the emergence of co-working and everybody banters around we work and many of the other examples of these spaces that are emerging and it's because they've hit on something um, and that's quite important and they focus on a group that has been um, neglected and that has been the remote worker, the freelancer, the gig economy um, employee um, who needed spaces and places where they can get inspired, meet people with new and innovative ideas and actually come together um, and work together to develop more complex solutions to tasks that they otherwise couldn't handle themselves. And so these spaces where people actually are attracted to one in the workplace, to, to want to work from, has actually become the model by which many corporate organizations are now starting to think about how they design and deliver their workplace experiences because they want to attract people to want to come to work there. They want to create situations where people can actually exchange ideas with new people in new ways so that they could develop a new innovative solution through serendipitous, serendipitous interactions. So this is this key aspect which end user centricity drives employee attraction and retention but often uh, neglected but equally important is integration particularly in better uh, and more project-oriented organizations, the ability for people to build relationships more quickly and more productively is where many of the opportunities lie. And over to you, Peter, about talking about how to deliver the service experience. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, well, <clears throat> um, I, I really like this picture, and, and this is uh, this is actually a picture from our U.S. Um, a business uh, where we are uh, providing services to a children's hospital in uh, California uh, and um, and actually the window cleaners uh, who are sort of repelling down uh, the facade of the building and cleaning the windows took them upon themselves for a couple of years ago uh, to dress up as uh, superheroes um, spider-man superman batman what have you 
um, because they, they thought that that was sort of would uh, make the day for some of these kids that are hospitalized and, and going to a rough time in terms of uh, getting healed and getting better and, and getting through their sickness. Uh, and of course that created a, a fantastic uh, moment, uh, not only to the uh, children, uh, which was sort of the light of the day when, uh, when some of these uh, superheroes were repelling down of, of the window and they could fantasize about there was really Spider-Man coming down or whoever it was. Uh, but, but definitely also for the uh, facility management organization of the hospital uh, and, and the doctors and the nurses, uh, even to a point where they were renegotiating the contract. Um, and, uh, and hopefully these guys were go do, doing a good job and also at a, at a, at a, f a reasonable price point. Uh, but it was actually the head nurse that came in and, and said, you know, we cannot take this away because this is the highlight of the kids. And, and, and it, it creates a complete unique experience for the kids that are hospitalized. So it's really not about cleaning the windows anymore. It's about creating that experience uh, on the other side of the window, which I really like. And I think the, uh, the, the challenge uh, to us, I think, uh, not working in children's hospitals, but working elsewhere, how can we take such a fantastic sort of uh, empowerment where, where the windows cleaners are taking it upon themselves to create that level of experience or service experience about what they do how can we bring that into the workplace on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think unlocking that is the key success to success here. Uh, there's no doubt about that. In order to attract people, in order to make them come to work, in order to create a high level of engagement, uh, as Jeff was talking about before, uh, we need to do something uh, of a higher value and of a higher standard that just cleaning the floor or making the, the food in the canteen or, or taking uh, greening a guest that comes into the reception or maintaining the the, the chiller uh, you know uh, it has to be we have to go beyond that we have to create different experiences and and how do you do that I think to to the best of our ability is is a, it's the old saying really about the high employee engagement drives great customer value uh, and great customer experiences and that also goes with the with with the service delivery system so we as facility managers need to make sure that we, we, are, we, are, we are engaging our, our teams, <clears throat> our service teams to, 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 to do a better job, to create better services uh, on a day-to-day -day level, to engage with the employees of the organizations that we are serving uh, on, a, on a higher level than what we have done before. And the only way we can do that is, of course, to train them, to engage them, to, to make sure that they have the right equipment and tools, but also to have the right freedom to actually engage with people, to create these service moments, to, to make an individualized, personalized uh, service moment for people. Uh, and that, that we can only do that by having uh, happier employees. Uh, there's no doubt about that. <clears throat> Harvard Business School has, has written numerous articles about that. They're sort of old. Uh, we have done a white paper in ISS about this also, where we uh, correlate between uh, customer engagement and employee engagement or uh, customer experience. Um, uh, in that in that sense, and that is a, a correlation uh, which is quite strong. There's also a very strong correlation into profitability and growth, uh, where you can directly correlate between employee engagement and 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 how profitable, uh, how much growth we can get into a contract uh, with that. And and not to go into uh, being too sort of psychological and and analyzing this, but nevertheless, I mean, it's really about the management style that we do, about the ambition and the perceived role of the individuals that, the, that are delivering the services on a day-to-day -day level. The old saying about, are you just chopping stone or are you creating cathedrals? We as managers need to understand that and we need to understand how that affects people. We need to create a higher level of sort of self-awareness, self-esteem and pride in terms of the trade that you're doing whether it's cleaning, it's technical management, it's energy management, it's catering, it's front of house, whatever it is, uh, we need, need to create, uh, we need to recruit people that, that see their own purpose in this, and we need to create that sense of purpose within what we are doing. And that will, if we do it right, it will infect the behavior and attitudes of which our employees meets the customer employees with on a day-to-day -day level, so we can create these unique service moments like the window cleaner. So we need to work more, much more with purpose and, and with the meaning of the work that I do and how it sort of fits into the bigger scale of things. The, the way that we are part of a strong t team and the way that we belong to the brand of the organization that we are serving and the empowerment that, that we as individuals feel that we contribute and that we are valued. 
exactly like the window cleaners in California did. So when you do this and when you do it right, you're able to create a service excellence that create that wow moment in the touch point where people feel that these are some frontliners and some service employees that goes the extra mile or the extra meter or the extra foot in, a, in order to create a, a better service experience on a day-to-day -day level. That's what it's all about. And this stuff can be designed. Uh, Disney has worked with this for a long while. Uh, Sappos, uh, Singapore Airlines, Southwest Airlines are all great examples of organizations that have worked with this for a while. We need to be much better at doing that uh, in the facilities management environment. And service can be architected. It can be designed. And there's no doubt that in, in our experience uh, that service design can create a better workplace experience by focusing on the end user experience. So we need to be better at analyzing this. We need to be better at co-creating this together with the client. We need to be better at prototyping and, and innovating sort of new uh, service systems, new technologies, new training methods, new engagement methods of our employees. And we need to implement this on the go. And, and, and we need to align the service need to the capability uh, of, of, of what we're having uh, the, both in terms of the capability of our staff, so we need to train them much more than what we have done in the past, but we also need to align the services to the demand that are happening uh, uh, on the site, on the premises, on a day-to-day -day level. Uh, it will create a bad service experience if we have, you know, 10 people waiting in the reception area to get signed in uh, to meet somebody they're having a meeting. They, they may get late, they may see us as, as a big hassle. And we can do that much better. We can assign more people to that. We can use technology. We can do different things in terms of, of designing that service so we get rid of these bottlenecks and we get rid of these sort of bad service experiences. Uh, so we create a higher standard uh, in, in the workplace on a day-to-day -day level. Uh, that is really important. Uh, at ISS, we have worked a lot with what we call touch points, uh, really sort of mapping the work journey out on a day-to-day -day level and then take each of these touch points describing, analyzing, describing, discussing, workshopping the service experience with the customer. For example, what does it mean arriving at work? Well, it's always a hassle. I can't find a parking spot. And whenever I find a parking spot, I need to put money in the meter or I need to whatever, uh, you know, and there's just a long walk and I'm always, you know, five minutes late because it's just such a hassle. Or I need to, uh, I need to get to work, uh, you know, two hours early just to get a parking spot. Um, can we do that in a different way? Can we optimize the parking experience so people get into the uh, to the facilities in a different way? When they enter the building, when they're met by the reception, is that a, a personal greeting? Do they know my name? Do they uh, help me to find a, a available desk somewhere? How can we do that? How can we design that experience so it becomes a seamless, positive, great experience to come to work rather than Oh man, I'm late. I'm running late. You know, the reception can't help me. I forgot my my key card. I can't get into the premises, and I have to sign all these documents up by a grumpy receptionist. You know, that doesn't help to create a better workplace and a better workplace experience. So each of these touch points, each of these work journey stop blocks, uh, is something that could either define and make a positive experience, or the opposite. It can make a very negative experience on your workday and 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 hinder the workplace efficiency uh, and, and not make you come to work. So every, every single one of these touch points can be optimized, we can design them, we can analyze them, we can understand them, and we can design a service delivery system behind any of these from the way you are entering the building to the way you are uh, you know, doing personal uh, sort of services uh, on the workplace. And, and we are in an area now where where the borderline between what's happening at work and what's happening at home uh, is, is fine. And, and as a service provider, you we need to go in and optimize when you're at work, how can we make the workplace as convenient and efficient as all possible? So when you do your work, you do it in the best way possible and, and vice versa. How can we make sure when you're off work that you have the leisure time, you have the spare time, you have the free time that you want to be with your family or your friends or your loved ones, whatever it is, you don't have to do the chores, you don't have to do the laundry, you don't have to do the cleaning at home, you don't have to do the gardening. And we're looking into that gray zone between work and home where we say, you know, maybe you could bring dry cleaning to work and get it rinsed and, and get it delivered to work at the day after. Maybe you can send and receive packages 
to the work uh, and use that instead of standing in line at the local uh, post office. Maybe you can get your you know car cleaned at work. Maybe you can do all sorts of other things. And maybe even at some point in time, as part of a B2B relationship, you can even consider doing uh, home services where you can get a you know cleaning at work as part of your 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 employment uh, with your workplace. That that that's a service that you also bring home in order to optimize you know being at work and being off work. Uh, which is, I think, hugely interesting and something we need to work much more with in the in the future. So, in order to conclude, no surprise, the differentiator is really people centricity and not technical capabilities or workplace sort of uh, technical setups, which I think we have a tendency to look at as facility managers. Uh, it has to be the people within the building, and how can we help them uh, with the interpersonal interface uh, to to create a real genuine emotional connections between the users of the building and and the owners and you know the, the organization that, that that occupy the building um, and and then connecting the built environment with the technology and, and using the technology as an enabler for great service experiences and, and great services at work uh, because I think we also have to acknowledge that in the future people will actually come to work for the great coffee the great lunch uh, experience to socialize and network with the, the colleagues, to have a great meeting with somebody, and not necessarily just to sit and work and be concentrated, because they can do that for so many other places. And it's a very individual thing, whether you want to work in a noisy, uh, and you can concentrate in a noisy environment, in a local Starbucks uh, coffee shop, or whether you want to be secluded in a very quiet environment. It's very individual. And, and we as facility managers need to accommodate, accommodate those uh, workplace um, uh, scenarios. Uh, in order, if we do these three things together, uh, we will have a great workplace experience and we can really help, help the organization by creating a better, better workplace and then win the war for talent to attract and retain the right talent in the organization because that's the key for the future. So uh, before I, I, I let back to you, David, uh, if you're still awake, it, I know it's very early in the morning in the U.S. <laughs> um, I just want to put a plug in. You can read more about this at our uh, landing page uh, betterworkplaces.issworld.com or our blog called servicefutures.com you can download all the white papers uh, all the white books uh, a lot of case studies a lot of articles uh, uh, around this uh, that hopefully will be uh, worthwhile so uh, thank you so much for listening from uh, me and Jeff and uh, back to you David oh, gotcha thank you Peter how could I possibly be asleep uh, Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited. And of course, I'm full of coffee. That helps. Anyway, let me launch a few questions at you. Uh, people are creatures of habit, so persuading them to change the way they work or operate is not always easy. How would you encourage these changes? Uh, things as basic, perhaps, as what time they go to lunch. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great question. Um, I think uh, all of this that we've talked about has uh, sort of an embedded uh, change management process, and we need to manage these trenches. It's absolutely right. P people are creatures of habits, and, and we can definitely do that. But I think it's about communication. It's about nurturing. It's about engaging. Uh, we have, uh, we have, you know, the facility management organization, whatever it is, if it's outsourced or in-house, I, I don't think that's relevant to this. But they have people on you know, on site, uh, on meeting people on a day-to-day -day level. So you can engage, talk to people. You know, why, why not let the cleaner say, you know, by the way, uh, did you know that uh, if you go to uh, the canteen now, there's no line, uh, which I, I, there will be at, you know, 1 o'clock. Uh, the reception, let, let these people engage with people in a much broader level and a much broader sense than we have done before in order to do that notching, in order to get people to change some of their habits in order to you know engage and, and give a better service experience I think all too often uh, we hide around uh, we, we hide our cleaners in the night in the early mornings late afternoons let them go out let them engage with the people let them be more of a concierge type of service rather than just you know doing the clean they could do much so much more of that and, and the more we get robotics in by the way the better it's going to be and the more we can engage with people so uh, so I, I think it's about notching it's about engaging it's about communicating uh, and then, then it's about managing some of these changes and, and incentivizing. I mean, if, if it's a paid canteen, maybe you can do a little discount. If, if you say if, if you come after, if you come before one o'clock, uh, but maybe there's a ten percent discount on, on your meal in order to even out the, the peaks and troughs of uh, of the canteen. Uh, we have tested that on a few canteens, and that definitely also works. So, uh, so 
uh, that's my best to say. I don't know if you have anything to add, uh, Jeff. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's well, one thing. It takes this aspect of one where are the challenges um, that you need to actually adjust. So what are the habits you need to change? Yeah. And then it's a question of, again, one aspect, if you're, if you're talking broad fundamental changes, um, that requires a very structured change management process, leading from the front, from, from, from top line managers, leading by example and accepting changes. Then you have the aspect, which Peter is talking about, the different nudges and incentive, incentivization aspects you can make to kind of push um, people into the directions you'd like to have. And then, as Peter was rightly saying, this aspect of automation, um, one aspect, yes, is it's going to affect the work processes, but it's going to enable um, facility managers to offer entirely different service offerings. And people want to know the inside scoop of how best to optimize their day. So the question is, how do you engage your service employees to actually go out and provide services for people that are just beyond the input-output is that place clean, but actually guiding an experience that makes their day easier. Hmm, thank you. Uh, I guess we could send Spider-Man by uh, during the time the line was short and encourage people to get on down and have their lunch. Um, yeah. <laughs> Spider-Man, not a, not a resource I want to take lightly. Uh, here's another one for you. Um, we facility managers are keen on the idea of service design, creating workplace experiences, and, and showcasing FM as best we can. What are the leading indicators for us that we're getting this right or that we should be looking in a new direction? What do you recommend that we look for? Um, that's a good, that's a very good question. So I think, I think surveying um, this on a regular basis is, is key in, in order to, to get that insight. Uh, so, you know, we do uh, customer, uh, well, we do customer experience surveys. Of course, we do user, uh, um, user perception surveys. We do spot checking, you know, as a, you can spot check in terms of the, the way the catering operation is, is operating and how satisfied people are going to the canteen or visiting the reception area. Uh, and then we do uh, employee engagement survey and, and, and the customer does employee engagement survey. And it's actually quite important that uh -huh. we can just sneak a few uh, questions in about that so we can use some of that. So I think having, having those surveys, I think, are, are, are indicators, and of course, of how we are performing. Uh, you were trying to intervene, David? Uh, I, I was no, having... no, not at all. Sorry, I was showing enthusiasm. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, one aspect I would say is uh, learn from the anthropologists and the people who do uh, site visits. Yeah. And, and actually, because one aspect I agree, you have to triangulate the, the problems. One aspect you can get from your survey data, um, but that's very momentary um, and it can be expensive and difficult to do. Um, um, with the design and everything like that. The other aspect is to set up ways to go out and just see how people are experiencing the spaces and looking at how do people look when they're in, interacting in the spaces. Um, and then you can start seeing, are they happy or not? Do they feel, do they look engaged? And there's processes and methodologies that can be deployed that many in the social sciences have used and taking those aspects into it with a people-centric focus and seeing how they're looking um, when they're doing it. And some of the aspects that are coming with the newer technologies are aspects related to corporate interventions, and this gets into uh, many of the new um, biometric badges, mood rings, and I'm not talking about 1970s and 80 mood rings that change color if you're stressed or not. These are actually uh, biometric devices that measure employees' well-being and these are being tested now in, in workplaces in, Scan in Scandinavia and in the United States. Um, and as these become cheaper and as the uh, issues related around uh, some of the ethical and legal requirements emerge, this will allow you to be much more targeted. Um, but but there, are, there are a certain, you know, with the technology available, you can use heat maps. You can see how people move around the buildings and stuff like that. But there is an important one I just want to mention because Whoever is, if you're using uh, sub suppliers or you have outsourced some of this, always ask for their employee engagement survey. As I mentioned before, happy employees create happy uh, customers. Uh, what you should ask for is the service uh, employees, let me see your, your employee engagement scores. I want to see if your people that are providing the services mm -hmm. are actually happy or not. Are they you know, not happy of being there? Are they disgruntled? Are there issues that we need to deal with? Because 
I think that's the key. And if there's is this one leading indicator, I would say that would be it. I would mm -hmm. always start with the service employees, the people providing the service. Check their measures. You know, talk to them, see if, how they're actually reacting uh, on this, because that will give you an indication of whether the service are good or bad. If they are not happy, the service is probably not good. And if they are happy, fine, then you probably go to the next level and look at some of the other uh, indicators for this. Yeah. So look at look at the shoes of the cobbler's children, huh? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we're right at the top of the hour. And uh, Peter and Jeff, I want to thank you. Uh, and move me on to the next slide, and I'll usher us out the door. There you go. Uh, we do have upcoming presentations uh, today. Uh, Wednesday, I guess it's going to be, and once it gets light out there. And uh, Thursday. Um, fmccworkplace.com has the list and uh, come have a look. Um, Andre, I believe you and Marcus are uh, at bat quite soon here from the look of it. So, but we invite you. Uh, next slide, Peter. Um, we also have uh, offer an app for free uh, for FMCC, uh, from FMCC, which puts resources at your fingertip on either an iPhone or an Android. Next slide. Uh, the STAG team, the action team for FMCC, is always, uh, always soliciting volunteers either on a project basis or come and stay. They check in, but they don't check out. But uh, do contact uh, fmccworkplace.org. And finally, we wish to remind you that IFMA is rich with councils and communities. Councils are industry-specific areas, um, such as airports and uh, legal offices and that sort of thing. And communities go across the the span of uh, councils, those are things like the operations and maintenance and health and safety coming together in the OMHS Council, where, where I'm a member. Uh, next slide. Thank you for joining us. And I'd say it's good night. I'm going to stop recording at this point. And uh, Peter and Jeff, you want to stay on the line for a little while? You're welcome. And thank you very much all for attending. Good night. Well, thank, thank you, David, yeah. and, uh, and good night to you, and good morning to the rest of us, uh, and have a great, great World FM Day. Thanks for joining. Thank okay. you. World FM Week. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.